All right, a very warm welcome everyone to the 25th Decolonial Learning Session of Adeles. We are a pan-decolonial network based in Amsterdam. And today we will have a very special guest in our midst, which is Samir Abed Rabo. And I will introduce him in a little bit. And we're going to talk about the decolonization of Palestine and the one state solution. Um, this session is organized, especially since it's uh, right now the 75th anniversary of the Nakba uh, catastrophe, which Samir will also tell more about, um, which was an important historic event for the displacement of uh, Palestinian. And of course, the displacement continues today. Um, but there's a way out of this, uh, which is now gaining more and more momentum or belief. Uh, you know, we have this, we have been presented a falsehood, which was the two state solution, but more and more people are understanding that there can only be a one state solution and what this entails, we will have in the second part of the lecture of Samir. Um, but in the first part, also, uh, before we know and understand why we should have this solution and how to decolonize Palestine, we first need to understand the problem as well. So uh, Samir in his first half of the lecture will also explain more about the current context of Palestine, historic events that led up to the current situation as well. So for the program, if you have any questions uh, that come up, feel free to send them in the chat also during the lecture or write them down on your notes. And I'll make sure that after the lecture, we have uh, space for Q&A. Um, about our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Samir Abed, Rabo is a Palestinian refugee born in um, the Kal Kalandia refugee camp. If I'm not uh, pronouncing it correctly, Samir, you Perfect. can. Uh, yes, great. Um, uh, so from uh, in, in Jerusalem, Palestine, he holds a PhD in international law and is the author and editor of several articles and book and is the lead author of both the Munich Declaration for the one Democratic State in Historic Palestine and the Dallas Declaration of the Movement for One Democratic State in Historic Palestine, uh, which were both published in 2012 and 2010. And uh, he will elaborate more on these as well uh, later. So uh, without further ado, Samir, uh, we are really looking forward uh, uh, for your story to be shared. So feel free to uh, uh, share screen. Um, it is right it is shared or not yet uh not yet okay so there's the green uh, button below uh, here it is yeah sure okay yes thank you we can see it I think you're not at the first slide though so you need to go one uh, or two back yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, and it's not okay. Just a second, you share. Yeah, if you click on it, and then you can use the arrows. Yeah. What's the matter with me today? It's not doing it. Share. Okay. It's not doing it. And did you click on your PowerPoint itself? Because yeah. maybe your computer thinks you're in Zoom and then it it's doesn't not respond. Doing it. It's not moving anywhere. Mm -hmm. Was moving before. Yeah, here it ah, is. Now it's moving. Yeah. Okay. Let us see. Yeah. It's coming back. Great. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. First of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be with you tonight. I'm sure uh, if we had uh, a choice, we would be somewhere else. But we are here together, and I, I'm going to be talking about decolonizing Palestine, how to de construct the settler colonial apartheid system that exists in Palestine today, and how to move forward to uh, hopefully establishing 
a more durable uh, solution, and that is the one democratic state in the entire uh, territory of Palestine from the river to the sea. Uh, you and I obviously have uh, many choices and options. We could be uh, part of the problem or we could be part of the solution. Hopefully by the end of this evening, you will join, join me to be part of the solution, not the problem. Uh, in Holland, Holland being very famous for its people riding bikes, I'm sure that you travel by bike from home to work, to school, to restaurants, to shopping. Uh, you don't have to worry about taking the wrong road, the wrong street, for being uh, or for belonging to the right religion or the right ethnicity. In Palestine, unfortunately, even little children, when they ride their bikes, they have to be aware of what street to take, since some of the streets are designed for Jews only. And therefore, if you happen to ride your bike on a street that is for Jews only, you risk your bike being confiscated by Israeli soldiers. Here is the street for Jews only or the street for Palestinians only. And this is the city of Al Khalil. It is one of the largest Palestinian cities on the West Bank. It has more than 200,000 people. The street on the left, which is the narrow one, is designed for the Palestinians. The larger street is designed for Jews only. You could tell that the street on the left has more people due to the fact that the city is a Palestinian city. So there are more Palestinians walking on that street, but there is no Jews walking on the larger street because the Jewish community in Hebron or Al Khalil is less than 500 people. And yet, they get the largest share of the street. Uh, if you happen to ride your bike on that street, the wrong side of the street, uh, for sure you get your bike confiscated. It is a Palestinian city. And because it is a Palestinian city, you could tell that the street that is designed for Israeli Jews, although Palestinians pay taxes, they don't get any representation, but you could see that the condition of the street is not even upkept because the size of the, commu the Israeli community is very small and it costs a lot of money to upkeep streets. Not only streets within community, within city communities, but also we are talking about roads that connect cities. And here's a photo that shows you also the streets are segregated. One part of the street on the right for a certain community, and the other part on the left is for another community. And if you look in the background, there is a military tower on the right. That military tower is to enforce, uh, strictly enforce the rule that Jews travel on the streets, on the road to the right, and Palestinians 
the travel on the road to the left. Remind you, the streets belong to the Palestinians and they are discriminated against. The roads on which, the land on which the roads that discriminate against the Palestinians belong to the Palestinians and the land has been confiscated in order to build segregated roads without the consent of the Palestinians and without compensating the Palestinians for the land that has been taken away from them. We talked about roads, we talked about streets. Here we are going to talk about walls. This huge wall with the military tower divides the communities based on religion and ethnicity too. So you might have the Jewish community on the left or the right, but there is no connection between them because there is a wall between them. There's all, this wall also sometimes divide Palestinian communities and lock them out from their property on the other side of the wall. And these military towers enforce this segregation or this separation wall between communities based on religion and ethnicity. I'm going to be talking about the wall uh, in the next slide too, but next to the wall, you will see that there is a checkpoint behind the wall. There is a military checkpoint that separates Palestinian communities from each other and separates Palestinian from communities that uh, the Jewish community in Israel itself. Here is the wall, and I would like you to look at, at it in order to compare what we knew about the Berlin Wall, which collapsed in the early 90s. As you could see, the Berlin Wall was 3.6 meter high, as opposed to eight meter high for the separation wall in Palestine that was erected by settler colonial Israel. The Berlin Wall was 155 kilometer long, as opposed to 700 and 23 kilometer long. Uh, if you look at the, high, the height of a person, a regular normal person, you are talking about 1.75 meter tall. The wall that separates Palestinian communities and separate Israelis and Palestinians is eight meter high. So you could stack more than four people on top of each other and you will not reach the top of that wall. Obviously the towers are higher in order to give the Israeli military uh, a better view to control and dominate the situation. We still are going to talk about the wall in the next slide. And here it is, the wall serves a purpose sometimes also other than separating peoples based on religion and ethnicity. It serves also a purpose of caging Palestinians, like unfortunately like caging them. We know what caging is and the picture shows that. This is, this meant to make sure that Palestinians, when they approach the military checkpoints, are herded in cages like that, wait until they are ushered in. So if a Palestinian wanted to visit 
his land on the other side of the wall, he or she has to come early enough, sometimes and instead of taking five, 10 minutes to go to their land across the wall, they have to come four, five hours or even longer and stand in line in order to be ushered in by the Israeli soldiers, the military checkpoint. If they wanted to go to a hospital, the same thing. If they want to go to school, is the same thing. If they want to go to church or mosque is the same thing. So their movement, their lives are controlled, dominated by Israel. If the Israeli soldier at the checkpoint refuses to allow the line to move, then the line doesn't move. You are stuck. So instead of taking a few minutes to go, or, or for example, if you are, if you want to go from, uh, from the city of Ramallah to Jerusalem, it should take you under normal circumstances less than half an hour. But as a result of the check, the military checkpoint and the wall at Kalandia camp checkpoint, it might take you hours if they allow you to enter. Although you might have a permit to enter, but sometimes it takes you forever to enter. We go to another form of segregation and dominance and control in the next slide. Here you have this beautiful community that was built on Palestinian land it is popularly known as a settlement. It is really a colonial settlement. It's not a settlement. A settlement could be a normal uh, residential area. But this in, these are in particular outposts, Jewish outposts that are built on Palestinian stolen land. And although they are based, uh, uh, built on Palestinian stolen land, Palestinians are not allowed to live there. Uh, these are Jews only colonies. These are not consented to by the Palestinians. The land that was taken was taken from the Palestinians without compensation or without their consent. There are 572 colonies on the West Bank alone, around 850,000 Israeli Jews lives, live in these colonies. And remind you, there are Israeli settlements for Jews only built on Palestinian stolen land. This has been the case, by the way, from the beginning. It is not only in the West Bank. Let us see the next slide and see how Israel gradually expanded from 1882 to the present. Pay attention to the blue dots. In 1882, there was a very small dot on the map. In 1947, a year before the establishment of Israel, but in a preparation for the establishment of Israel, you see the present where the Jewish presence was, and you see where the Palestinian presence, the rest of it, Palestinian presence. Then in 1966, just before the 1967 war, you could see where the Jewish presence was and where the Palestinian presence was. And by the way, Prior to 1967, 
Israel was established on 78% of the land of Palestine. As of 1967, Israel became in control of 100% of Palestine. As we speak today, you could look at where the, unfortunately, where the Palestinians are, the gray areas, and we will see another slide showing a larger picture of it. The gray areas are decreasing and the Jewish community, the Israel is taking over more and more Palestinian land. And always remember, we are talking about without the consent of the Palestinians and without compensating the Palestinians. As of today, we are, we have one government, and that is the Israeli government, in control of all of Palestine from the river to the sea. Palestinians have no say in what goes in Palestine. Their consent is not taken. Their lives is controlled and dominated by Israel. Here, from 1948 to 1949, forget the brown shape, the brown colored ones, and just concentrate on these dots. All right? The West Bank and Gaza were supposed to be Palestinian territory, where the Palestinian state was supposed to be established. Those little brown dots throughout the map were supposed to be Palestinian villages, Palestinian communities. You had cities, large cities, Haifa, Yaffa, Ishdod, Asqalan, above Gaza. We will see in the next slides what happened to these little villages, more than 530 of them, and we will see what happened to the West Bank and Gaza. Here we are. In 1948, 530 Palestinian villages were completely destroyed, obliterated. You might find one building or you might find the cactus tree because the cactus tree lives under hard conditions. That is an indication that a Palestinian village was there at one point. But these villages were completely obliterated. Most of the Palestinians some figures will tell you 750,000. Some figures will tell you 800,000. But my most reliable figure is that more than 1.2 million Palestinians were ethnically cleansed. It was a deliberate, systematic Israeli policy to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. In 1948, more than 15,000 Palestinians were murdered, were killed, tens of thousands maimed and injured. The methods used by Israel is force. Tens and tens of massacres were committed against Palestinians. And here you see samples of these massacres. Some of them involved a small number of people, others involved hundreds of people. Israel used another method in order to 
tremend to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians. Most of the water resources that were used by Palestinians were poisoned. So some Palestinian communities became ill, became sick. Their animals became sick. The reason why these massacres took place, the reason why the poisoning of their water well took place is to prevent these Palestinians from ever returning back. The reason why these villages, the 530 villages were destroyed is because you discourage people to come back to a place where you don't have a house anymore. You don't have a home anymore. So the destruction of these villages, the destruction of their homes, the poisoning of their wells, the massacres committed against them is literally to sow panic and to prevent the Palestinian and fear, panic and fear, and to prevent these Palestinians from returning. We'll move on to the next slide. Here's the West Bank that was occupied in 1967. You remember I told you pay attention to the brown color locations on the map of Gaza and the West Bank. They did not only, the settler colonial apartheid Israel was not only satisfied, was not satisfied with taking over 78% of the land of Palestine. When it came to the West Bank, they started also chipping away on the land that is supposedly for a Palestinian state owned by the Palestinians. So as you could see, most of the West Bank has been taken over by settler colonial apartheid Israel in order to establish the 572 settlements, colonial colonies, and in order to move more than 850,000 of its own Jewish citizens in order to take over the land of the West Bank. Not only that, if you look at the Palestinian communities, the white colored Palestinian communities, you could see how they are sliced up they are sliced up like uh, in order to prevent any continuity between the Palestinian communities. And when they are sliced up like that, you play, you put your military checkpoints in between, and therefore you dominate and control all aspects of Palestinian lives. And that's exactly what takes place in the West Bank. The West Bank, the Israeli, the Israeli army could an, at any time control the movement of Palestinian from one community to the other because they are sliced up like that. And in between them, there are military checkpoints. And the roads, some of the roads are for Jews only, and some of the roads Palestinians could take, and the roads that the Palestinians could take, they are controlled by the Israeli military at any time. If you look at the West Bank as we speak today, the land that is controlled by the Palestinians don't amount to too much. More, not more than 10% of the total land of Palestine. The rest of it, as we speak, 90% is controlled and dominated by settler colonial apartheid Israel. Even in the 10% that is supposedly under the control of the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian Authority has no authority. It's only name, it's only a name. 
literally the Israeli army could go anywhere, any place, arrest people, kill people, uh, confiscate more land if they so choose uh, at any point, at any time. Next slide. As of 1967, you, I want to give you some just basic numbers. From 2008 to the present, 6,269 Palestinians have been killed. And these Palestinians have been killed for being Palestinians. In comparison, 293 Israelis have been killed. Israeli Jews have been killed. Persons injured, 146,638 Palestinians have been maimed and injured. In comparison, 6,149 Israelis have been maimed or injured. The total land confiscated from Palestinians, 230,000 hectares. The number of colonies for Jews only that have been established on Palestinian land is 572 Palestinian uh, Israeli colonies. The number of Jews moved to populate these colonies is 850,000 Israeli Jews. Not only they confiscated the land of the Palestinians, moved their citizens to populate these colonies, they also have uprooted more than 2 million trees. Most of these trees are olive trees. And the olive trees, for those who know a little bit about the Palestinian economy, it is the backbone of most of the farmers. It is their main source of income. The number of homes destroyed in the West Bank alone you are, we are not talking about the 530 villages that were destroyed in 1948-49. We are talking about the number of homes in the West Bank and Gaza that were destroyed by settler colonial apartheid Israel is 12,350 Palestinian homes. By the way, there is a story to tell about the atrocities, the criminality of colonial settler apartheid Israel when it comes to destroying Palestinian homes. They destroy Palestinian homes and sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time actually, they require the Palestinian family to destroy it with their own hands, to hire a bulldozer to destroy their own home, to pay for the destruction of their own home. That is the criminality of colonial, uh, the colonial settler regime that dominates and controls all aspects of Palestinian life. If you looked, when I told you the West Bank was sliced up, there is no continuity of Palestinian communities. There is no connection between them. Look at what the map of apartheid South Africa a lot of similarities. Not only there is an affinity between the Zionist ideology and the apartheid, the African apartheid ideology of South Africa, but similar 
communal situation between both states. I want to go over some basic facts on the ground as we talk today. As I mentioned earlier, there is only one government between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. Somebody will think that there is a Palestinian authority. There is a Palestinian authority, but the Palestinian authority has no authority. It was created there under the illusion that a Palestinian state will be allowed to be established on the West Bank and Gaza, and the West Bank and Gaza are supposed to, to be no more than 22% of the total land of Palestine. As we speak today, this land that left uh, in the hands of the Palestinians in the West Bank is not more than 10% of the total size of Palestine. There's only, I, I argue, and I am here to prove that there is only one government between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea, and that is settler colonial apartheid Israel. The Palestinian Authority has no authority, and there is no opportunity at this stage to even consider the notion of establishing or creating a Palestinian state because Israel is in control of all of it. Anyway, the historical posts that we want to cover or I want to cover with you, there are 10 points. And here is that Palestine was occupied in 1917 by Great Britain. Great Britain gave, uh, entered into almost uh, a contract with the Zionists from 1905 to 1917 to create a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Oh, yes, uh, Israel was created in 1948 or established in 1948, but really you could argue and successfully prove that Israel was established by Great Britain in 1917, not in 1948. In 1947-48-49, when Israel was declared quote unquote independent, it was in control of 78% of the total land mass of Palestine. In 1967, it became in control, military control of 100% of Palestine. This settler colonial apartheid state from the beginning denied the existence of the Palestinians as people. worked in order to literally dehumanize them, destroy their presence, work to erase their uh, legacy and culture and falsify the record. To this day, although Israel does not need the permission or uh, a United Nations resolutions, although we have so many of them, Israel could say, look guys, yeah, we ethnically cleansed you. We made a mistake. Now we are in control of the entire land. Please come back. We might not be able to give you your old home, but we could work things out you are allowed to return. To this day, Israel, in violation of international law, 
in, via in violation of numerous uh, UN resolutions, does not allow the return of the Palestinian refugees to their villages or to replace these villages with another piece of land in Palestine or to build for them settlements as they built for Jewish colonial settlers to compensate them for the land that they have taken over or for their pain and suffering. And instead, they move more and more Israeli colonial settlers to the land which is still in the hands of the Palestinians. And by the way, if you go to the Rome statue, these are crimes against humanity. These, the moving of your, the transfer of your own population to a land that is occupied by force is in violation of all aspects of international law and conventions. Israel since 1948 to the present has instituted laws, policies and practices that literally dehumanize and abuse Palestinians. I'm not talking about only dehumanize and abuse Palestinians in Palestine, but it is carrying that policy outside of Palestine to dehumanize Palestinians, abuse them even in Holland, in Germany, in the United States. Palestinians are not allowed to express themselves. Palestinians are not allowed peacefully to defend themselves because Israel works with these governments in order to criminalize peaceful discourse. What is better to use a BDS uh, campaign or uh, having a lecture on a campus or to shoot with guns and bullets. Israel does not want the Palestinians and their supporters to advocate peacefully outside for the Palestinians. This is the kind of the dehumanization that has been taking place, not only inside Palestine, but also outside of Palestine. It discriminates against Palestinians. There are more than 65 Israeli laws on books that literally discriminate against Palestinians. So we are not talking about just a military guy at a checkpoint uh, ordering a Palestinian to be arrested without cause or uh, ordering a Palestinian to return because that guy didn't like the shape of that Palestinian or the looks, all right? Because the Israeli military officers are allowed to issue regulations to control the lives of Palestinians at any time. But we are talking about institutionalization, the institutional, 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 anyway, we are talking about the institutional discrimination against the Palestinians. We are talking about laws on books that discriminate against Palestinians and favor Jews. Israeli Jews and Jews from Holland, Jews from Germany and Jews from everywhere. A Palestinian who was ethnically cleansed cannot go to Palestine, return to Palestine. But a Jew, any Jew who has no connection to Palestine can go and claim a citizenship in Israel and live and take the land that belongs to the Palestinians. The discrimination, the policies, the uh, laws, the regulations, 
they are all based on religion and nationality. Jews are favored, Palestinians being Christian or Muslims are not favored, they are not in favor. We talked about Israel, settler colonial apartheid, Israel do dominating and controlling all aspects of Palestinian lives. We're not talking about just uh, freedom of speech, controlling and dominating freedom of speech, the freedom of movement, freedom of worship. We are talking sometimes about your freedom to marry the one that whom you love. All right. If you are, if you happen to have, happen to live in Ramallah and you fell in love with somebody in Umm al, -Um al Fahim or Haifa, uh, you could marry her, but that person has to lose her citizenship in Israel and move to Ramallah in order to live with that Palestinian in Ramallah, but the Palestinian in Ramallah cannot move and live with her in Haifa. All right? So they are, they literally control even that aspect of it. If an Israeli Jew want to marry a Palestinian Muslims, they will make a hell of out of it before that happens. No rabbi is going to agree to it. You have literally sometimes to go outside of the country and do it and be subject to all sorts of discrimination. All Palestinians are looked at as a security threat. And because you are looked at as a security threat, you could be killed because you are a Palestinian at any time. In fact, most of the killings that are taking place in the West Bank, as we speak today, they are done because the other person is a Palestinian, not because he has done anything to harm anybody. We are talking about men, women, and children are being killed because they are Palestinians. Settler colonial apartheid Israel steal Palestinian natural resources, including land, water, and natural gas for the benefits of Jews only. We already established that by showing you these settlements, these colonial settlements. They are built on Palestinian land, but Palestinians cannot live there, cannot enjoy the benefit of their land. There has been discoveries of gas of the coast of Gaza. The Gazans don't benefit from the gas. Israel benefited from it. Israeli Jews benefit from it. Uh, the same thing with water. Water belongs to the Palestinians, but Israel tap it, use most of it for Israeli Jews and sell some to the Palestinians. Remind you, it is in Palestinian land. Uh, settler colonial apartheid Israel curtails the basic rights of Palestinians. Basic rights, we are talking about freedom of expression, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, we in Holland, Germany, United States, we enjoy these basic facts. They are given in Palestine. They are not allowed. In the West Bank, if you are to approach a checkpoint with the demonstrations against its presence, they will open fire for sure at the demonstrators. They will not allow it to proceed. If you want to go to exercise your right to freely express, uh, to freely worship, you are not allowed. And we have seen what happened in Al-Aqsa Mosque. 
during Ramadan, people were not allowed to worship normally and freely at Al-Aqsa Mosque. Many of them have been arrested. Some of them have been killed. You, in order to go to worship in Jerusalem, you have to have a permit. Just imagine if in Holland, suddenly the Dutch, the Dutch government decides that every Jew who wants to go to a synagogue have to have a permit. What kind of an, a policy is that? What kind of, uh, of lunacy is it? But that's what the Palestinians are subjected to. Uh, Palestinians, as I mentioned before, literally can be killed because they are Palestinians. Settler colonial apartheid Israel systematically works to change the Islamic Arab character of the places that it occupied, it controlled, it dominates. For example, Jerusalem, tomorrow there's going to be a march, a flag march by Israeli Jews to celebrate Israel's independence. But Palestine, Jerusalem, especially West Jerusalem, is entirely an Arab city. The character of it is an Islamic Arab cities. You see Israel is systematically trying to change the character of that city as it has tried to change the character of all commu Palestinian communities. You will see these buildings that are being built, they are out of place. They have nothing to do to the culture to the legacy of the Palestinian people. They don't long, they don't look as if they belong there. And by the way, changing the, the character of these localities is in violation of international law, again, and in violation of many United Nations resolutions that have been, uh, that have been st stacking uh, them for the last, uh, 75 years. Settler colonial apartheid Israel is deliberately uses dr draconian measures to break the will of the Palestinians to resist and to be free. Under international law, people under occupation have the right to resist the occupiers. Palestinians, if they resist, they risk being imprisoned, being killed, or being fined, or their properties being confiscated or destroyed. So you try to break that spirit of resistance among the Palestinian people. Mainly, Mainly, I think they use psychological warfare on the Palestinians. Uh, for example, if you are with your family, uh, they try to target the man in front of his wife, in front of his children, dehumanize this person, abuse this person. If they go in the middle of the night into a house in Palestine, for whatever reason, some of it for a reason, most of the time without a reason. They will gather the family members in the house and they proceed to beat up the male in front of the female, in front of the children, all right? And these are the kind of measures that Israel takes in order to dehumanize, dominate, control, break the spirit of the Palestinians to resist and to be free. The question that I'm always asked, is Israel a colonial state? Without a hesitation, Israel is a colonial state. I already established the fact that it has been established as a colonial state by Great Britain 
starting from 1917. Some will uh, would say, no, it was established in 1948. We are not going to argue about that, but Israel was established by Great Britain. The colonial power that was in control of Palestine at the time. It was done without the consent. Sami, one small interruption in between just for the time, uh, because I know we have two goals. One is establishing um, the current situation and the colonialism of it. And the answer is clearly yes, and you've elaborated on it. Just wanted to give you an indication of time that we're halfway the session so that we can focus also on the second part, which is focused okay. on the uh, solution. But do continue, but just letting you know um, so we have enough yeah, time. To I'll, take, I'll take a few. I'll take a few minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. If you zoom on number four, settler colonial Israeli Jews ethnically cleansed by force most of the Palestinians in 1948. Those expelled are denied the right of return in violation of international law and numerous UN resolutions. In 1947, the Palestinian population was 1,324,000 people. In 1948, a year later, the population was reduced to 156,000. So more than 1 million people were ethnically cleansed. The question is, why aren't these people allowed to return? They don't need my permission to return them. They don't need the permission of anybody to return them. But that speaks volume as to the nature of the beast that we are talking about. In 1946, Jews only owned 6.7%, including land that was given to them by Great Britain. The rest of it was owned by Palestinians. Anyway, we move on. Is Israel an apartheid state? I, I think I already established that Israel is an apartheid state. Not only that, it has uh, laws on books discriminating against people based on religion and ethnicity. They also have practices on the ground, communities that are for Jews only, streets are for Jews only, roads for Jews only, and we have a humongous wall that is 723 kilometer long, separating people from each other. I am going to move, I think, with all of these with all of these practices against the palestinians by the state of israel we have we when i say we we palestinians have advanced and invited like-minded israeli jews to join us in order to start looking for the future, because this, uh, this present that we live in is uh, not sustainable. Sooner or later, something has to give away uh, to reason and logic. And we have been for the last more around 15, 20 years, have been coming together in order to discuss a way out. There is no way at this stage uh, you could literally, uh, you could have, uh, anyway, uh, just cosmetic changes. Uh, the two-state solution is a cosmetic change of the realities because you are going to keep uh, settler colonial apartheid Israel in dominance and in control. You have to undo this system of domination and control and separation and think about a better way for the future. 
And we have come up with uh, the one democratic, the vision for one democratic state. And I am going to share with you the 10 principles of the one democratic state that is incorporated in the Munich Declaration, but it's also incorporated in many other declarations. The first one is one democratic state or ODS shall be established in the entire territory of historic Palestine between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River as one country that belongs to all its citizens, including all those who are currently live there and those who, who were expelled over the past century and their descendants. So what does it mean? We want to take what exists there today, the settler colonial apartheid state and replace it with a one democratic state for all of its citizens, including all those who live there today and those who have been expelled or ethnically cleansed by Israel from Palestine in the last 7,500 years. Nobody will be asked, nobody will be expelled, nobody will be asked to leave. However, those who disagree with the principles of one democratic state, they are always free to leave. The second principle, that the country or the state shall be an independent sovereign state in which all citizens enjoy equal rights and all can live in a freedom and security. So there will be no discrimination among the citizens of the state based on any criteria. Equal rights for all. The third principle, ODS in Palestine will end ethnic cleansing, occupation and all forms of racial discrimination from which the Palestinian people suffered under Zionism Israel. We believe that all forms of discrimination shall end. The occupation shall end. and the suffering of people shall end. The reunified, number four, reunified Palestine shall be a democracy in which all of its adult citizens shall enjoy equal rights to vote and for uh, stand for office and contribute to the country's governance. No state law, institution, practice, or activities may discriminate among its citizens on the basis of ethnicity, religion, language, nationality, or gender. So a state that is going to be democratic has to uh, protect, defend uh, equal rights to all, eliminate any form of discrimination against its citizens, allow for cultural expressions, allow for cultural freedom, number five, the state shall not establish or accord a special privilege to any religion and shall provide for the free practice of all religions. We have in the West, we are especially in the United States, there is a separation between church and state. And we want that our state to have that. However, we want also the state to guarantee and protect the right to practice their religion if they so choose. We don't want them to stop. We want them to continue practicing their faith 
and the state shall protect it and defend it. However, we don't want as in the state of Israel today that Israel is a state for the Jews or a country for the Jews only. Number six, one of the primary objectives of the new state is to enable the Palestinian refugees to realize their right of return to all the places from where they were expelled, rebuild their personal life, and participate in creating the new state. Palestinian refugees, by the way, they are not only refugees outside of Palestine. There are refugees inside of what exists as Israel today. There are people in Haifa, they live in Haifa, but they are not from Haifa. They are from the towns and the villages that have been destroyed and their land have been confiscated. So even Israeli citizens who happen to be Palestinians, right, inside Palestine are also, some of them are refugees. So we want these people to return to their places, to reclaim their ownership. That is just exactly the same as Germany allowed Jews to reclaim their properties, to return and claim their citizenship if they so choose. Private property of Palestinian refugees shall be restored. And if you cannot restore these properties, you give them property of equal value to their properties that have been taken away from them. That a compensation is to be paid for them for the use of their property or the damage to their property and for the pain and suffering that they have encountered. Number seven, public land of the state shall belong to the nation as a whole and all of its citizens shall have equal access to its use. As we speak today, most of the land that was confiscated from the Palestinians is held by the Jewish National Fund. And the Jew Jewish National Fund leases these properties and rent these properties to Jews only and use it for the benefit of Jews only. We want that public land to be held by the state for everybody. The natural and economic resources of the country shall benefit all of its citizens equally, regardless of ethnicity, religion, and what have you. Number eight, the state shall provide the conditions for free cultural expression by all of its citizens. It shall ensure that all languages, arts, and culture can flourish and develop freely. All citizens shall have equal rights to use their own dress, languages, and customs, and to express their cultural heritage free of insult or discrimination. To try to be a Palestinian, expressing your cultural identity in uh, Tel Aviv and see what happens, or in Jerusalem and see what happens. To try to fly the Palestinian flag somewhere and see what happens. Uh, number nine, citizens shall have equal access to employment at all levels and in all sectors of the society. Employment shall not be determined or restricted by language, race, religion, gender, or nationality. Education and vocational training shall not be segregated or specialized in any way that impedes equal access of all citizens to employment and other opportunities to fulfill their talents and dreams. As we speak today, Jews have the advantage. If, the, if you are a citizen, if you are, if you are a Palestinian citizen, you still have a disadvantage as opposed to 
the privilege granted to Israeli Jews. I'm not talking here about West Bank Palestinians. West Bank Palestinians don't even have a chance because they are excluded. I'm talking about citizens in Haifa, Yaffa, and other places who have to happen, who happen to have uh, Israeli citizenship. If you, if a Palestinian and an Israeli Jew to apply for the same job, the Israeli Jew have an advantage over the Palestinian uh, in this case. Number 10, the state shall uphold international law and seek the peaceful resolution of conflicts through negotiations and collective securities in accordance with the United Nations Charter. Israel, instead of, the, of accepting UN charters and sitting down with the Palestinians uh, and allowing them to uh, return, Israel abused them, used violence against them in order to dominate and control. As I said, if Israel wanted to obey or abide by international law, they don't need to wait for anybody. They could do it on their own. They're already in control and dominance of the whole country of Palestine. They could literally say, we are going to implement international law regardless, and we are going to allow the return of the Palestinians to their homeland, but the return to the homeland has to be on stages has to be systematic, it has, be, it has to be arranged, all right? But Israel is not interested. Israel is interested in more domination, more control, more expropriation of land, more ethnically cleansing of Palestinians, more destroying of the homes, and more uh, abuse of Palestinians. Uh, we are also calling that uh, that this state shall seek and contribute to the establishment of a Middle East that will be free of all weapons of mass destructions. Forget the lies of settler colonial apartheid Israel for, for, for a second. Forget their policies and posturing for a second. Iran is not a nuclear power. Israel is. Israel does not have nuclear weapons to use against anybody. Israel have nuclear power uh, weapons to use. In fact, in 1973, they armed their Jericho missiles with nuclear weapons in order to use them against Cairo, Damascus, and other places. So, in a democratic state, as South Africa, when South Africa was transformed, changed from the apartheid system in South Africa, South Africa had six nuclear warheads. When Mandela took over just before the change, those six warheads were destroyed. We want to do the same. Israel, by the way, by all accounts, has more than 200 nuclear warheads, one of the largest, and it has both biological and chemical. And by the way, they used both the biological and chemicals on Palestinians. The biological, when they poisoned the the water wells, both in the Galilee up north and in the south, and they used chemical agents in their assassination attempts against Palestinians. These are the 10 principles that we hope the one democratic state to be established on and to be able to dismantle the edifice of the colonial settler apartheid system that exists today. Uh, it is not an easy project. Uh, 
it's not an easy thing to accomplish. Uh, it requires uh, lots of work and a long struggle to accomplish. But I think the continuation of the policies and the practices of settler colonial apartheid Israel is making this vision closer, making this making people realize that this is better than what exists. If I was talking to people 20 years ago, most of them would have considered me a lunatic, crazy person. But nowadays, there's no other solution available. Either we continue with settler colonialism and apartheid, or we wake up and work together in order to realize the one democratic state solution. It is much better for both Israeli Jews and for Palestinians. And that's what we hope to accomplish. That's what we hope that you and I will become a problem solvers instead of contributing to the problem that exists today. I am going to stop here and hopefully we could have a good discussion uh, on, on the subject. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Savir. I think um, everyone can agree you have a very clear way of explaining, very calm, even though it's like quite a heavy subject, a lot of information, but you've explained it quite clearly. And I think we have uh, at least a basic understanding of what's going on, historic events that led up to it, and also what could be the solution um, or the only possible available solution right now. So what I'm going to ask everyone to do is uh, for this period to think of uh, questions and that you can drop in the chat, but also feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand and I can give you a turn. And then you can ask uh, questions or give comments directly. Just do know that you are being recorded. So if you feel uh, you want to uh, remain anonymous, feel free to use the chat. And maybe to break the ice, uh, I'll ask a first question, uh, Samir, um, so that I can uh, give people time to gather their thoughts as well. Um, is I can imagine when we, um, let's say, want to lobby for this one-state solution, and, uh, uh, and maybe you find uh, questions or fears for people reacting or hearing this for the first time. And I think one of it can be, and maybe you can explain more about it, you said it uh the right of return, right? It's a very fundamental right. It's also established, of course, in the UN and makes uh, morally common sense. But you also said this sentence, we're not going to displace anyone. And I can imagine a reaction can be, yeah, but there is now Jews living there. We're not going to displace them. Can you um, explain, like, how do you give the right to return without displacement? Elaborate a bit more on that part or that vision behind it. Uh... There are a few things to discuss here. One major thing is the fact that Israel has a law of return for Jews only, that any Jew anywhere could come and live in Israel, take the place of a Palestinian and live in Israel. I think that policy has to stop and Jews like any other person could come to Palestine through the immigration policies of the new state, but not through an automatic entitlement to come to Palestine and be an automatic citizen. So we stop that aspect. The second thing to pay attention to, there are a lot of land, a lot of land. Most of these Palestinian uh, villages that have been destroyed, they are sitting idle. The land is there. Uh, you could allow these Palestinians to return to their land that is there, all right? Uh, I'm not saying that we should get all the 7 million Palestinians return at once, but we could have 
start a dialogue as to how we can have uh, uh, a program or uh, a scheme of things in order to allow the gradual return of Palestinians to their land that is already there. The land that has been taken in order to house uh, Jews only, uh, first that Jews only have has to go. Uh, people are entitled to live wherever they choose, wherever they want, wherever it is available. The second thing, we could compensate them for that land by giving them land somewhere else. All right? That's second thing. Uh, not all Palestinians might choose to return. So what do you do to those who choose not to return? You want to be able to get compensate them fairly for the property that the state is going to take over, the new state is going to take over, or Israel has already taken over, in order to make, to make it fair and just to them. All right? Uh, so there are many steps that one can think of in order to uh, affect the return of the Palestinians to their homes. Uh, there are, I, I, am, I was shocked, shocked when I visited certain communities, including Haifa uh, and even in Jerusalem and other places, but Haifa in particular, there are a lot of home, Palestinian homes in Haifa that are, that are not lived in by anybody. They are vacant. But these homes have owners, and these owners are refugees. These refugees, if they are allowed, they will go back tomorrow and rehabilitate these homes and live in them and enjoy their life, normal life, as it was before. Why Israel is not allowing them to return especially when these homes are sitting idly, vacant, with only crows living in them. Yes. Thank you, Sami. I purposely fully asked this question because I heard uh, it was Samu Abosita. I think I think you know his work as well, mapped all these yeah. villages. As well. And I was so surprised to hear indeed that Sometimes people are living behind a wall, and then like a, a few, like few hundred meters or few kilometers, there's still this land that is empty that was there. They won't have to displace anyone. They just, but they're not allowed to return. And these empty, like even 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 yeah. when the when the Supreme Court of Israel ruled in favor of the people of Ekret and Kofor Berem to return, they were not allowed to return. Yeah, you are yeah, really so, uh, the claim. The claim that Israel is a democratic state. A democratic state will follow the orders of the Supreme Court if the Supreme Court uh, is fair and just. And they ruled for the return of the people of Ekret and Kufur Baram to return to their villages. The Israeli army, the uh, Israeli security establishment, refused to allow them to return. To this day, to this minute. And by the way, those two villages are the only Maronite, Catholic Maronite villages in Palestine. Thank you, Sami, for elaborating on that. And uh, I see now a question came in uh, from Fajr. Fajr, if you like, you can um, unmute yourself and ask the question. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, for your presentation very clear and uh, also it relates um, a lot to me uh, uh, my father was from west papua and uh, well we have a situation pretty similar <laughs> to the situation in, uh, in 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 israel and for the palestinian people 
um, and um, uh, from the the ten uh, rules from uh, from your moving forward to a one de democratic state, I was wondering. You just said that seven million people uh, uh, are now refugees, and um, perhaps not all of them will return, but it will have, uh, I think, a great demographic uh, shift uh, uh, in the between uh, the yeah would cause a great democratic shift and also uh, for the for a democracy if you're moving towards a democracy how would that uh, how would it uh, uh, come out in the future if 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 a large uh, amount of the people will return to Israel and how would it uh, yeah how would be the division and in the de democratic uh, in a democratic state Remember, in a democracy, democracy is not uh, a protection of the majority. A protect, uh, in a democracy, it is a protection for the minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, a true democracy will undertake to protect the rights of the minority and make them equal, giving them the opportunity to be equal in an equal society. We are not saying that uh, in a democratic society, we have to have one person, only one person, one vote. But we are saying that everybody, regardless to religion, ethnicity, or gender, will have equal protection of the law. Whether you are a minority or you are a majority, the democratic system will protect your rights as if you are a majority of, uh, of one, all right? For example, the freedom of speech, if it was left to the majority, the majority will not allow the minority to talk. But we want to have a system that regardless who is in the majority, that allows the minority, even if they are one, to be able to speak, to be protected, to be defended, and not to fear the majority. The same thing. Uh, we, we could talk about these uh, in the United States, by the way, and I'm not saying that the United States system is an ideal. It's not an ideal system. But in the Constitution of the United States, there are certain and basic rights that cannot be abridged, all right? That everybody is entitled to, is uh, allowed, uh, is entitled to, without fear and intimidation by anybody. For example, the, Con the Congress of the United States cannot pass a law not allowing uh, uh, Black Americans to freely express themselves. It just cannot happen. Yeah, Black <laughs> Americans don't have the New York Times, but still they could demonstrate on the streets without fear okay. of intimidation and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, the situation in West Papua is very different from that because, uh, well, uh, the, the, the indigenous Papuan people are outnumbered at the moment. And, well, Indonesia is, uh, the Indonesian state says it's, it's a member of the UN and, and says it protects the, uh, the freedom of speech, but in practice, well, it doesn't no, help. No, so I'm, I, I'm curious. I yeah. agree. Uh, it yeah. doesn't look. In order for us to safeguard our rights, we have to struggle for it. If the constitution yeah. says we are entitled to certain rights, we are entitled to certain rights. Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying across the board, I'm not saying that a minority or a majority, I am not, I, I am, I am leery of the role of, of uh, in a democracy. Democracy could be a, uh, uh, one of the worst things that 
can happen to mankind if it does not guarantee the rights of the minorities. That system has to guarantee the right of the minorities and protect it and defend it. Thank you. Did that I'm, I'm, your I totally question? agree, but I'm just wondering how it would, uh, well, in fact, uh, um, the rights of the Palestinian people um, yeah, are even backed up by, uh, by numerous uh, UN declaration, uh, UN resolutions, and even uh, the, the part, part status of a part, the status of party in the within the UN, and even uh, even with the backup of the UN, it cannot be accomplished. So now I see where you are coming. Now yeah. I see where you are coming from. I I understand that. Remember, we are talking about uh, a change for a shift from moving away from the rule of force to the rule of law. Yeah. Uh, if we have to have the guarantees of the international community, we should search for it and obtain it. But I know for a fact that the international community now, although they support Palestinian rights, but they don't have the power to enforce it. And the reason why we don't have uh, our rights established in Palestine is because the United States in its lack of wisdom and Europe in its lack of wisdom decided to side with colonialism and apartheid mm -hmm. instead of the rule of law. That has to be changed. And the only way it's going to change is if we, the people, could put a pressure on these organized and put a pressure on these governments to realize the facts on the ground and to realize that their path is leading us to more bloodshed mm -hmm. and more discrimination and more all this kind of thing. They're not doing us a favor, by the way. They are literally causing bloodshed. Yeah. And if it wasn't for them, Israel will not continue. Israel will not continue to be uh, the colonial settler apartheid state. And I am reminded of South Africa. I am reminded of South Africa, although unfortunately a lot of mistakes have taken place in South Africa after the change. Uh, but it was people like you and I putting pressure on South Africa to come to its senses mm -hmm. and to realize that the continuation of this evilness has to stop. Hopefully it will happen in your homeland Hopefully it will happen in mine, but we have to come yeah. together and work together and help each other in order to do it. In South Africa, I know I know of friends who would they wanted to buy, for example, engagement rings and uh, what have you. Before they will even consider buying anything, they would ask, "Where did this stone come from? If it came from South Africa." They didn't buy it and they told the guy, they told the guy, we are not buying it because it came from apartheid South Africa and we don't accept the apartheid system. So hopefully it will happen the same because Israel produces more, by the way, sells more diamonds than anything else. And it does not have a single diamond mine in Palestine. We don't have diamond mines in Palestine but they sell more diamonds than any other th than more than weapons by the way all right i hope the people will wake up and start asking the same question where did this diamond come from if it was a if it was polished and cut in israel they should have stopped buying it so in order to achieve the one democratic state first there must be more public awareness about the 
and public pressure, right? In order to- Correct. Uh, yeah. Correct. We need to be aware and we need to work together. And by the way, those 10, the, 10 principles that I recited, that I read, those could be applied anywhere. Those are universal principles. What yeah. makes them easy to agree with and to work with is because we are not trying to exclude anybody. We are trying to, to, to create a system that will benefit everybody, mm -hmm. that will treat everybody equally, will treat everybody in fairness. Even those Israelis that might not agree with they might not agree with the change and they wanted to leave. I even go sometimes and say, okay, if you don't agree with these principles and you wanted to leave, and by the way, more around one third of the white South African people left the country after the change. One third of the total white population of apartheid South Africa did not agree with the change and they left. I say, by all means, if you choose not to live in a democratic society, by all means, we give you even one way ticket out. <laughs> Go to Holland. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I wanted to um, see if there's one or two final questions uh, from other members before we close off the session. I see one coming in from the chat. Uh, the question is, Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Do you think a radical imagination and collective solidarity is needed to have uh, the one democratic state solution? How can Adeles or other platform members support and help with the creation of ODS? And uh, thank you for that question. And I think that's the maybe the most important takeaway question for this session. And maybe to also say what was interesting when you were talking about South Africa, I remember, I mean, it was not my generation, I'm a younger generation, but when I heard older generations talk about the change that happened in South Africa, many people believed at the time it could never be done either. So it was like it suddenly went very fast and you never know when the tipping point is reached. Um, but it wasn't like very fragile. It was very uh, stable uh, or it looked stable apartheid regime. And many people also I believe it. I want it's, to, it's before yeah. I address this, before I address the question, I want to give you a, an, a, an episode that is, I think, apt to describe uh, the situation. Uh, I was asked, I was literally asked in the 80s, uh, do you think the situation in South Africa, you think by your activism, you could change the situation in South Africa? Um, I, my response was very simple. The situation, I might not change the situation in South Africa in my lifetime, but most definitely, I don't want the situation in South Africa to change who I am. We all have an obligation, a moral obligation, to stand for what is just. And the, and, and the cause of South Africa was a just cause. The cause of Palestine is a just cause. The, Papua Guinea cause, uh, cause is a just cause. We all have to come together, organize, and this is bringing me to the question. We have to organize. We have to collectively come together and coalesce together and start working together in order to build a better place for our humanity, whether it's in Palestine or any other place because we all lean on each other. We all need the help of each other. We cannot do it on our own. We need everybody to be involved. We need to organize. We need to stand for these principles, not to compromise them. Uh, and we, we will get there as we got there in, in the case of South Africa and other places. Uh, I remember I'm old enough to tell you that 
I I came I come from a very poor family. Uh, we were given very small amount of money to buy to buy things as kids would buy. And instead of buying things, I used to collect my pennies and donate them to the Algerian Revolution, for example. Not that much. I don't think they made the difference, but at least the feeling that I was doing something. In the case of Palestine, we are demonized. We are literally dehumanized in the West. By having you on our side, walking side by side, by organizing events like this, that literally will make us at least uh, less vulnerable to the dehumanization process that is being thrusted on us by the colonial settler apartheid Israel. By understanding our plight, by working to free, to free even the Israeli Jews from themselves, you will be doing us a tremendous uh, favor, tremendous help. Organizing is important. Standing in solidarity with us is important. Organizing is important. Anything that can be done within the law. We are not asking to go to break the laws, but even the laws that are not just and fair when it comes to freedom of speech, freedom of organization, freedom of all these freedoms, we need to start or uh, to start uh, enlightening the politicians in order working with politicians, working with lobbies, working with what have you, in order to change their attitude on the subject. Thank you, uh, Sami. I think these are uh yeah beautiful both personal stories uh to share and also concrete things that we can do to support the cause so thank you so much samir uh i think i will officially close off the session but people can still hang out a little bit um after i've closed off also for the recording and for the people watching back uh so this was the 25th decolonial learning session with samir abed rabbo and uh, we had the pleasure to have him. You can watch back this lecture on YouTube or Spotify, uh, as well as all the other sessions that have been previously done. And we will make sure to also include the slides on our blog and some extra reading materials and the Munich statement so you can read it back and use them in your own uh, environments. And uh, feel free to also uh, leave a donation uh, for our organization so that way with the donation we basically give it back directly to the speakers so in that way we also support uh, the efforts of the speakers to come and share their knowledge with us so of course the donations are appreciated you can find the donation instruction on our website or in the confirmation mail that you have uh, received and also please don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter via our website so thank you all for um uh joining us in this session and um there was a final question we're not going to answer it now but we'll include the link how or where can we join the one democratic state uh, uh, uh initiative we will make sure to include that link as well on our blog so you can find it thank you everyone for joining this session <laughs>